When I was in elementary school, so this was 18, no. It was in the 1900s. There's probably kids who are like, the 1900s? Ah, oh, that's a long time ago. Uh, using a calculator to do your math work was considered cheating. You weren't allowed to do that. You weren't allowed to use a calculator. Uh, I did not like doing homework at all. Work in general has been kind of a drag. Uh, I like it more now than I did then, but I didn't like doing it. And a calculator would have made things so much faster. So much faster, right? Uh, but the idea was that we should learn math so that we understand how it works. Right? The teacher would say things like, what if you're out in the world and you don't have a calculator? So that you guys know, young people, back then, the calculator was like a separate thing that you had and you would use it. It was, it was not something that you always had with you, right? You're not going to always have a calculator. I mean, they were wrong, right? But uh, remember the calculator watches? It was like a watch and you had little buttons on it. Those are you. are like, no, I'm not that old. You are. You remember that. Anyway, I really wanted one of those. I think I had one at one point. I mean, the buttons were so tiny, but it was cool and so nerdy at the same time. But the idea was, if you really want to actually understand how to use math, you have to learn it. You have to learn how it works, right? You have to memorize the fundamentals so you can understand not just what the answer to an equation is, but why? Why is that the answer? My wife is a uh, math teacher. Some of you know that. Uh, and she, that's where I met her, actually. Uh, I was, she was my teacher in high no. <laughs> she was not. She was in high school. I was like 40. That's what, it, that's what a lot of people think. People have asked if I'm her dad. That's not a lie. It's pretty sad for me. Um, <laughs> I'm not, by the way. Uh, I know we came from Tennessee, but that's not a whole... <laughs> we grew up here. We grew up here. Anyway, this is going off the rails quick, right? <laughs> We're in for today. <laughs> anyway, my, my, my wife's a math teacher, um, and so she teaches her kids, her students, math, right? Uh, I'm sure they're allowed to use calculators and stuff these days because, of course, you're always probably going to have one, but she wants them to understand she wants them to understand. Some of them like math, if you can believe that, and they get really into it, and they love learning about it, and she's teaching them, and they're responding to it, and it goes really well. Some of them maybe don't like to do it so much, and they cheat, or they avoid doing the work, and so on, uh, and you, know, you have to walk through that. But you want to know the fundamentals if you're going to do something well. If you ever want to move on in anything, you got to know the fundamentals first, right? If you don't know the fundamentals, you can't remember them, or you can't put them into practice, you're going to always be operating at a basic level. You're going to be a basic bro. That's the bottom line. If you go in for brain surgery, you want the surgeon to know the fundamentals. I'm guessing you don't want them to go, hey, can somebody hand me that Sharpie Cuddy thing, right? That's not what you wanted to hear. Or like as you're starting to go under, it's like, does anybody remember how to do this? You don't want that, right? You want your brain surgeon, well, you'd probably prefer not to have brain surgery, but if you do, you want your brain surgery, surgeon to know the fundamentals, hopefully a lot more than the fundamentals, right, if they're going to do brain surgery. As Christ followers, the same thing applies to us. We need to know the fundamentals if we're going to move on to maturity. you got to get the fundamentals right if you ever want to move on to maturity. Listen to what the Holy Spirit says in the book of Hebrews. Yeah, this is what the scripture says. For though by this time, this is Hebrews 5, 12 through 6, 3. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the first principles, the fundamentals, the first principles of the oracles of God. You don't even get the fundamentals of the scriptures, even though you've been in Christ long enough that you should actually be teaching them. That's what's being said here. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled and the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, because of that, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, the fundamentals, let us go on to perfection, go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. 
And this we will do if God permits. He's not saying those aren't all great things. He's saying those are the greatest things. Those are the fundamentals. But if you don't get that, how are we ever going to move on? How are we going to grow? If, the, if you were married for 25 years, and the most you remembered was your spouse's name, and like maybe what town they came from, and it had not moved beyond that, right? And you kept forgetting that. Anyone ever forgot an anniversary? Don't raise your hand. Don't do that. Your spouse will get mad if you tell everybody you forgot. If you don't know the fundamentals, what kind of a relationship is it? It's not much of one, right? The scripture is exhorting us, Christ followers, believers, to move on. But they're not ready because the scripture says, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. They needed the fundamentals. They needed the first principles. They hadn't gotten it yet. They were not focusing on the task at hand. They were not studying. One of the things that is so important to me is that we recognize where we are, where we are in history, who we are in this culture at this time, in this place. And you cannot just think of your Christianity as I think a lot of us did for a long time, like it was important, but it was something we did, something we were a part of, but it wasn't the thing that drove everything because we had a basically kind of Christian culture and we sort of went into this Frankly, if we're going to use the scriptural term, sort of this lukewarmy Christianity where a lot of people went to church and we did the thing and we said hi and someone was talking to me this morning talking about putting on your Sunday go to meeting face, right? You come in, hey, everybody, how you doing? And you do that thing. But then the rest of the week, it's, you know, eh, whatever. You can't be like that anymore. You can't be, you should never have been like that. We're, we're talking about first century stuff here and they're saying they should have been like that. You certainly, we are 2,000 years closer to the return of Christ whenever he's coming back, which I expect to be soon. But we have to, have to move on. We've got to be serious. We've got to be focused. These folks weren't focused. Some of us aren't focused. There's nothing wrong, by the way, with an infant in the faith. I hope to have lots of them come through these doors and get saved. If you're new in the Lord, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. For all of us who've been in the Lord to walk with men and women and children who are new to coming to Jesus Christ, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Just like a real baby is precious, so is a new believer. It's a precious thing. But when you're still on the bottle 20 or 30 years later, if you see a 30-year-old pull out, you're pulling out a coffee and he pulls out a bottle, you're like, that's not precious. That's kind of ugly. Kind of weird, right? It's not how it should be. Same thing for a believer. If you've been in the Lord 20, 30 years, and you don't know the fundamentals, you haven't been focused. You know, it's the kind of thing you confess and repent and move on, but you haven't been focused. We read this in the scripture. You have come to need milk and not solid food. That's what they need. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Don't you want to be skilled don't you want to be skilled in the scripture? Don't you want to be skilled in knowing the truth? You should. How else are you going to make disciples for Jesus Christ? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded you. For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Right? That's the great commission. How are you going to do that if you're unskilled? If you're a babe? For he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. When we don't know the fundamentals, we're babies. Little babies. We're unskilled in the word of righteousness. Solid food belongs to big boys and big girls. Now, it doesn't really matter what age you are. You can become an infant Christian at 100 years old, and you could have been in the Lord for 10 years at 15 years old, right? It doesn't matter what your age is. The question is, what are you doing with the time that you have in terms of focusing on the word of God and focusing on discipleship for yourself and for other people? There are too many Christians walking around with pacifiers, and drinking spiritual milk who are unskilled in the word of righteousness. They just are, right? We call them binkies at our house because we have a couple little kids living there. You want your binky? Sometimes there's Christians who, they need a binky, spiritual binky, okay? It's not a good thing. It's not pretty. If we are the body of Christ, and we are, and we're standing as soldiers, and we are, a shield wall, and we are, marching against the gates of hell to set the captives free in the name of Jesus Christ, and we are, then what's with the bottles and the binkies? It's not going to work. You, don't, if it, you are not going to be afraid of a bunch of soldiers who come up drinking out of bottles. 
with binkies and blankies, right? That's not exactly a scary thing. If we're going to be soldiers and move forward, we've got to look like men and women of God who are very serious. It's time for us to grow up as Christ followers. And this may or may not apply to you, but it's important for all of us to understand. We've got to grow up as Christ followers. Strong and tested, true and faithful. Wise and studied with our hearts on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we need to be. And there's a survey done, came out a little while back this year from Ligonier Ministries called The State of Theology. Uh, Ligonier has been doing this survey every two years. I think it goes back at least as far as like 2014. It may go back earlier. Every two years, they do this survey and they try to kind of take the temperature. They ask questions to see where Americans fall on different theological or scriptural viewpoints. So they ask these questions of Americans. Survey has really highlighted some information about Christians and their understanding of the fundamentals of the faith or the fundamentals of Scripture. Give me a second. Uh, two seconds. Yeah. I appreciate your grace. The survey has highlighted some information about Christians that is concerning. Or I don't know if I'd call it concerning. It's frustrating. How about that? We're going to get into the survey. We're going to walk through uh, the fundamentals that so many Christians are struggling to understand so that you can be built up, so that you don't have to go around with a binky and a blankie and a bottle, okay? You may wonder sort of what our vision at Acts Church is. This may be your first time. Uh, if so, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. I hope you get to meet some of these people. These are some amazing people, not because they're so amazing themselves, but because Jesus Christ is in their life and the Holy Spirit is in their life and they worship the Father and they love people. So get to know somebody if you're new, if you've been here for a while, whatever. You might, you might be wondering kind of what our vision is about what we do in terms of teaching, why we do teaching the way we do. I recently asked a man who used to be at Acts Church, uh, used to be a, a part of the church here, uh, but has gone to another church uh, job somewhere else and that kind of thing. And uh, I asked him, so what's the difference you know, between what your experience there and what Acts Church was like in terms of sort of vision teaching from the teaching standpoint? He's, this is what he said. This is the text. I'd say a difference in teaching style is that the, the new church is less heady or information driven and a bit more emotional and practical driven. Not dramatically, but it leans more that way. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Uh, well, I don't know. I'm, uh, there's, there's nothing. I don't want to get into whether or not more emotional, more practical is better than more heady, more information driven. I don't really care about that question. It's probably true that a lot of uh, churches want to be a little bit more emotional, a little bit more practical because people like that. They like the practical sort of give me the practical application stuff. And, and I'm not, not going to say which one's better or worse. Don't care. But I am interested in telling you why we do things the way we do. Because we're not called to be any other church. And here's why. This is a church with a bunch of individuals who make up the body of Christ, who have their own giftings and, and their own walk with the Lord and so on. And so we're going to be different than maybe this church or that church or the other church. And that's okay. That's, that's who we're supposed to be. In this case, our teaching style is a reflection of that. We feel called to teach the scriptures clearly and consistently because we want to build you up so that you know the scriptures. I am more interested, and I think the elders of this church, thank I know the elders of this church are more interested in you knowing the scriptures so that you can do the practical application because you know the scriptures so well without us necessarily having to tell you. Now, it's not that we don't do any practical application. We do, okay? Like, for instance, I'm going to talk a lot about giving today. I'm not really. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you should do that. Um, not for me, for you. Uh, but here's the thing. We're working together to build the foundations so that you can hold on to Christ through the scriptures no matter what happens. No matter what you go through in life, you've got to be built up in order to do that. If your foundations are not strong, you will fall. It's that simple. Buildings found, if this building has bad foundations, at some point, it's going down. If you have bad foundations, at some point, you're going down. That's how it works. There are a lot of people walking around calling themselves ex-evangelicals or deconstructing from the faith. And here's the deal. The problem is these people did not understand or they didn't believe in the foundations in the first place. They did not believe in the fundamentals in the first place. They may have heard all the right things. Some of them may have been able to tell you all kinds of stuff about what the Bible said, but they obviously did not get it in their heart because if it's in your heart, it ain't crumbling. It's not going away. You might have doubts from time to time. You might have questions. That's fine. We're all here for that. There's no question that you can't ask. 
Okay, that's fine. But if your foundations crumble, they weren't very strong. And so I look at a survey like this and I go, well, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that we have as many people deconstructing, which is a very popular thing to do with some people, or becoming ex-evangelicals, which again is another popular word people use, because their foundations weren't built strongly. It's a bummer. I have kids, right? I have two children. I would love for them to follow Christ every day of their life. But here's the thing. I know that they have to have their own foundations. I can't give them mine. I can't give you mine. I can teach what the scripture says, but you have to build your own foundations, your own relationship with the Lord. That's true of my children. That's true of every person of this church. That's true of every person, period. But in order to get it, we got we to gotta teach it so that you can get it inside yourself. You have to let the Holy Spirit teach you and grow you. But you have to put in the time and the effort to do so. It isn't going to happen by itself. If you do, you'll be strong. If you don't, you'll be drinking milk out of a bottle spiritually and walking around with a binky and a blankie. That's just the way it is. There, there is no other way. If you decide not to focus, not to put the work in, to understand the fundamentals of the faith and then move on, you will be a child in the faith and you will go like that forever. And when you come before Jesus at the Bema seat and he says, what did you do with what I gave you? And you say, TikTok. Twitter, right? I said that because English people like Twitter. I don't know if they do. I just, you know, I don't know. Do you want to, you want to say that? What did you do? Football. I watched a lot of football. Well, great. Do you know the fundamentals? Not really. Not great. Not great. We're going to deal with uh, these survey results. We're going to strengthen ourselves in the truth. This is the first message in this, in this series called Foundations. Um, and this first one we're calling the truth about truth. Okay. I'm only dealing with two questions from the survey. There's like 30 something. I'm dealing with two questions in this one, Lord willing, we'll get through both of them. And they have to do with people just not even understanding the basics about what truth is. Okay. So here's the first statement from the survey. We're going to look at it says this religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. So that's a statement. And they're saying true or false. Okay. Religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. Before we get into the results, we need to make sure we understand the statement. Religious beliefs are beliefs about almost everything you believe. Almost everything. When you get right down to it, what you believe religiously affects what you believe about everything else. It's going to drive what you believe about everything else. Or at least it ought to drive what you believe about everything else. Sometimes you see people holding very inconsistent beliefs. We'll see some of that here. Or they believe this, but then they also believe this, and they don't make any sense. But generally speaking, your religious beliefs are all your beliefs. But we'll assume that those answering the question when they heard this thought of religious beliefs as questions like whether God exists, who God is, whether the Bible is true, etc. Those kinds of beliefs. When you say religious beliefs, I think most people would at least think those things. The next part of the statement describes what kind of beliefs these are. What kind of beliefs are religious beliefs? Are they personal opinion or objective truth? A personal opinion is by its own description personal, right? An objective truth is something that's true no matter who believes it or who doesn't believe it. It's outside of you. It's either true or it's not true, okay? It's very different than a personal opinion. My existence is an objective truth. I don't care whether you believe that I exist. I'm right here, okay? You can, you can say, in my personal opinion, you don't exist. My response is, you should probably get back on your meds, right? <laughs> like that's, I'm right here. I'm right here. You can't say anything. You can't say anything to change it. You can't think anything. You can't have an opinion. All of that would be useless to change the truth of my existence. A proper understanding of truth is understanding that statements or beliefs are true if they correspond to or if they match reality. If you say something that matches reality, then what you've said is true. For instance, if I say it is 11 a.m., 10.54 a.m., Pacific Daylight Time, and it is in fact 10.54 a.m., Pacific Daylight Time, then my statement was true. Why? It corresponded with or it matched with reality. That's what truth is. Now, it can be somebody else's opinion that it's 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and they can set their watch for that time, and they could live as if it was 10 a.m. 
but they cannot change the truth about what time it is. Doesn't matter what their opinion is. Doesn't matter what they put in their watch. It is 10.54 a.m., assuming that clock I'm looking at is right. If it's not, then I said it isn't true, but you get that. That would be the corollary. What happens is, is that things get muddy, and people say things like, say this become very popular, my truth. This is the problem. Truth has a meaning. Words mean stuff. My truth, when you're talking about things that are objectively true or false, is a meaningless statement. It can't be yours. You don't own the truth about what time it is. It just is that time or it isn't. It doesn't matter what you think. That's, that's truth, okay? I don't care if they say, I, it's 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and that's my truth. That's meant to settle the matter, by the way. When people say that normally, it's meant to be like, so you can't say anything else about it. Because I've said this is my truth. Right? And so, oh, I, okay, well, I don't want to get in the way of your truth, after all. How can you argue with somebody else's personal truth? This is actually just a subtle perversion of actual personal truths, which there are, like the fact that you do or don't like chocolate ice cream. Everyone in here has an opinion. We could talk about it. We're not going to. But you have an opinion. I like chocolate ice cream. I don't like chocolate ice cream. That's your truth, okay? You live your truth, all right, with that. I've lived my truth a little too much on that. I'll let you guess whether I like it or not. That could be your truth, right? If you say, I don't like chocolate ice cream, I'm probably not going to say, yes, you do. I don't know what you like or what you don't like. It is. It's your truth. It's your personal truth. It's a tr- what you're really saying is, there's an objective truth about what's happening inside my brain or taste buds or whatever, and I'm sharing that with you. It's, my, it's a truth about me. That could be your truth. And then we just pervert it just a little bit. And we start saying, no, I can have my own truths about other things than just say my tastes. You can't deny somebody's truth about whether they like chocolate ice cream. That's silly. That's silly, right? It's, it's your own statement about your own personal feelings. But what time it is, that's not chocolate ice cream. It's nothing like chocolate ice cream. It's an objective fact that exists outside of you and your personal tastes. doesn't matter whether you'd like it to be 10.57 a.m., which it is now, or whether you don't like it to be 10.57 a.m. It just is. It just is 10.57 a.m. Now, you guys probably are like, this is so boring. I know this. Good. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you know it. Because objective facts are true. It does not matter how you feel about them. It does not matter whether you like them or dislike them. You are not in control of their truth. You can't make them true or not true. God is real and God is glorious. These things are true. Okay? Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, this is what C.S. Lewis says. This is in the book, The Problem of Pain. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. All right? You can't change objective truth about who God is. He's either real or he's not real. So when we talk about religious beliefs, that means something, right? Religious beliefs. They're objective truths or falsehoods. Your opinion can't change them. God either exists or he doesn't exist, right? The Bible is either true or it's not true. Jesus either rose from the dead or he didn't. That historical fact happened or it didn't happen. When we say it, we're not talking about, well, maybe it didn't happen, but Jesus rose from the dead in my heart. No, no. He either rose from the dead or he didn't. And if he didn't, we are wasting our, we should be watching football, right? It's probably a good game going on, Right? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then you're still in your sins, and we're not saved, okay? So these are objective, true or false, true or false, you're either made in the image of God, or you're not. Were you made in the image and likeness of God? There's a truth about it. Salvation is by grace through faith, or it's by works, or some other thing, or there is no salvation, but there is a truth about it. Your personal opinion has nothing to do with religious beliefs. Religious beliefs, by their nature, must be objective. They must happen outside of yourself. The last thing they are is dependent on your personal opinion. So the statement in the survey, religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. That's either true or false. It's false. It's false. Now, the surveyors here did what surveyors sometimes do, and they gave people five choices. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, not sure, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree, which I don't like. 
for a statement that is clearly either true or false, that sort of five different choices thing doesn't work for me. There is one right answer, one among the five. Strongly disagree. It's the only one that's right. If you said, here's the thing, when we talk about objective things like whether something is true or false, you don't get to have shades of that. If I say two plus two equals four, I would say agree or disagree. You disagree, you're wrong, you agree, you're right. If you said, I somewhat agree, red mark, you got that one wrong. You don't understand how math works. So, in this case, the only correct answer of the ones to choose from is strongly disagree. Religious belief is not a matter of personal opinion. So, how many people, how many Americans got it right? Throw it up on the screen. 19%. Education is so good. It's not. It's not. Less than one in five Americans answered this question correctly. Four out of five Americans are somewhere on the spectrum of wrong answers. I think uh, the culture might be infected and affected by some pretty nasty thinking. Some bad ideas, some bad logic, some bad reasoning. All the proof you need is this. This is an easy question. This is an easy question. Obviously, truths about God are either true or false. They have to be objective. Now, it's possible they didn't know what the word objective meant or personal opinion. Another educational problem, if that's true. But the truths about religion are no different than any other truths about anything else that is real. Trust me, atheists don't think that your opinion matters any more than Christians or Muslims or Jews or Hindus or whatever. Everybody thinks it's either true or it's not true. There is no personal opinion for those who understand these things. And to have four out of five Americans believe in some level of the my truth, because if you didn't say it's, you know, strongly disagree, you believe in some level of the possibility of the my truth thing, that's just foolishness. And it's telling. But we broke this down. There's other groups. So we have the evangelical Christians who probably answered this right, right? They probably answered this correctly. Here's what the survey said about, this is how they define evangelical, so you can know before I show you. This is, these are things that they had to strongly agree with, these statements. The Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. It is very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that can remove the penalty of my sin. Only those who trust in Jesus alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. That's pretty good. They had to strongly agree with all those statements to be considered an evangelical, or in some cases, their church affiliation would have, would have put them in that category, but their church affiliation would have believed all these things, okay? So these folks, they're going to crush it on the statement about objective truth, right? They believe the Bible is the highest authority for what they believe. They believe Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. These folks must have this figured out. Let's see it. Better. I'll let you count the red ones. 47%. Strongly disagree. More than half of people who said they believed all those things answered this question wrong. More than half of evangelicals are on the spectrum of wrong answers to this question, meaning some shade of your truth, my truth, has crept in. Like, it it looks so much better than, like, the world at large or Americans at large, so it's like, oh, okay, until you look at all the ones, the great ones down here, and you go, over half? Over half of people who believe all those things also think those things aren't objectively true but their own personal opinions? Hmm, not great. Teaching is important. Teaching is important. Building up the mind God gave you is important. If you don't build up your mind, you can be deceived by the flow of culture. And you'll end up answering these kinds of questions wrong. Evangelicals were, again, well over twice as likely to answer correct, but still less than half got it right. If this is my classroom... Then I had taught, and they took the test, and 53% of them failed. I would feel like maybe I hadn't taught it very well, or they weren't listening real good, right? They wouldn't be good. But maybe if we narrow it down to evangelicals who attend church at least once a week. Because there's a lot of evangelicals, right? And they're like Christmas and Easter, or they go every few months. or Once a week, right? They're getting the good stuff. They're likely getting teaching consistently. They should be 100% on this. Let's see. A lot of gray ones still. 
They got to 55%. They got over half. If you go, if you're an evangelical, meaning you believe all those things, and you go to church every week, we still only get 55%. If there's 20 of them, nine of them got it wrong. That's not good. That's not good. I had to do that fraction reducing on a calculator. I just, I did. No, I did it on a computer because I had to find the kind of calculator that reduces fractions. Let's not talk about it. My wife is back there. She's going to be really upset. They said they believe that the Bible is the highest authority for what they believe. It's very important for them to personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus as their Savior. Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that can remove the penalty of their sin. Only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. They said they strongly agree with all those things. And 45 of them that go to church every week did not say clearly that what they believe was objectively true. There's actually a decent number in all these categories who strongly agreed with the statement, which is crazy. Crazy. We need 100%, guys. This should be any, this is like, you know, the ball's on the tee. This is not a tough, this is not a splitter coming in at 102 miles an hour. This is, some of you are like, what is that? It's a baseball thing. This, this ball's on the tee. It's easy. We should be, it should be 100%. We need 100% of the Christ followers to be able to answer this basic question. And basic questions like this confidently and consistently. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Colossians 4, 5 through 6, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. You can't answer anybody if you don't have the fundamentals. And you're going to feel uncomfortable. you are be like, I do want to evangelize. I do want people to come to know Jesus. I know that they're going to hell if they don't. I know that they're, they're outside of his grace if they don't. But I don't know the fundamentals. 45. Out of 100 people that are going to church every week and believe these other fundamentals don't understand that their truth is objective. That's true whether they believe it or not. It's not a personal opinion. Or they don't understand it fully. If you're a Christ follower, you cannot confidently and effectively answer basic questions about truth. Here's the deal. I'm not mad at you. We just need to work harder at studying the Word and at using the mind of Christ that we have because we have the Holy Spirit. We all need to work harder, every one of us, me and you, to know the truth and be able to give an answer to the world, the world that is dying without Christ. I'm not surprised that when you take a basic group of Americans that you get one in five who believes religious beliefs are personal opinions. That's the world. They're deceived. But we are not deceived. We have the Holy Spirit. Lord willing, during this series, we will address some other issues like moral issues that the State of Theology survey brings up. Many of those moral issues have become infected and affected by this kind of relativistic, foolish, my truth kind of thinking. Because if you get this wrong about your religious beliefs, you know what else you're going to get it wrong about? Everything else. If you don't think whether God exists is objectively true or false, what is it going to do when you're talking about sex or money or you know uh, issues of doing what's right with your neighbor and so on? Those issues are definitely going to be personal opinions. If Whether God even exists is a personal opinion. It gets ugly fast when you don't think well. Truth is true. That's a tautology. It's objectively true. One more statement from the State of Theology Survey. This will be the last one we do. It's 1108. I think we've got time. Here's what it says. God accepts the worship of all religions. All religions including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. That's the statement. God accepts the worship of all religions. Then they include the the monotheistic, major monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But they're saying all religions. Now again, this is a true or false statement with only one answer that makes sense. Strongly disagree. Okay? That's the answer. God does not accept the worship of all religions. Okay? There's only one listed here that he accepts. Christianity. That's the only one he accepts, okay? This is not complicated. Let's talk about why it might be difficult. But there is no other God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Worship of any other is not worship of God. He does not accept it. This statement says, accepts the worship of all religions. 
That is absurd and vile. You know there are religions that, re- that worship darkness and demons and idols and power and sex and money. And there's, there's, there's religions that do this kind of thing. It, it's crazy. The answer to this question is so obvious. But the world wants plurality. The world wants what they call tolerance. Now, let me be clear about something before we get all culture worry. I will tolerate, I will have tolerance to live in society with you pretty much whatever you believe within reason. There are a few things that I'd be like, no, you're not going to be my neighbor. But I will never allow you to believe that you are worshiping God when you are worshiping worthless falsehoods and false idols. If you are worshiping falsehoods and false idols, I'm not going to say, yeah, God accepts everyone's worship. I'm not going to say, let's just read a little scripture. Little scripture, 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Romans 1, 1 through 4, Paul, the bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. <sighs> Listen, these religions, including Islam and religious Judaism, they deny that Jesus was God. They deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They deny it. But Judaism says he didn't rise from the dead. And the Muslim religion mostly goes with the swoon theory. He was beaten. He was on the cross. They stabbed him in the side. They put him in a tomb. A little cool air flowed and he went, whew, that was close. And and never was dead. That's That's what they go with, okay? It's nonsense. But they deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They deny that he was God. Okay? They deny salvation by grace through faith. They, they have a works-based religion. They deny the saving work of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. They believe falsehoods. They do not worship God because they do not know his son. That's the bottom line. I know it is controversial. I know it is confrontational to believe and speak the truth about the way, the truth, and the life Jesus Christ as the only way to the Father. I understand that. But you have got to stand strong and tell the truth. You're not going to be popular in a world where only one out of five people even believes it's objective truth when you're saying, oh yeah, it's objective truth, and by the way, you're wrong about it, and God does not accept your worship, and you need to turn to him and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, or you're going to die and go to hell because you're in your sin. People don't like that. It's not fun at the cocktail party to be the guy saying that, right? It's just not. And guess what? It is the most loving thing you could ever do. You are sinning against your neighbor if you lie to them. That's the bottom line. The the reason people answer this question, let's be honest. We know why they said, yes, God accepts the worship of everybody. They don't want to get into it. They don't want to deal with it. They just want to say, yeah, sure. I doubt that they, I cannot believe that they really believe that when they say, I believe the truth of the scripture, right? But, But Americans in general, they're going to say, I don't believe I don't believe that mine is the only way, because if I say that, you're going to get mad at me. You're going to get mad at me. Let's, let's read some more scripture. Matthew 10, 32 through 39. I didn't bring my glasses up here. All right. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men... Him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. When you want to just say, yep, he accepts all worship, it's all good, you do you. Boo. You live your truth. 
He says this, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We love reading it. It sounds good. We're going to do it until you get out there. And somebody goes, you think I'm going to hell? And it's like, "Uh, what do I say? Yeah. Maybe be a little nicer. Like, well, do you accept Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered your life to him? No. Well, then he says you're going to hell. Don't put it on me. Don't put it on me. This is a scripture. I'm good. I'm not the one who's... Who's deciding who's saved? Now, he wants you. He died for you. He, he, he would forgive your sins if you turn to him. But yeah, you don't believe? Yeah, you're under the wrath of God. Jesus is the only way. The only worship that God accepts is worship of him, of God. The real God, the only God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's it. There is no excuse. Nature and scripture testify to God. The truth is available to all men. To all mankind, every man, woman, and child, the truth is available. Now, let's look at how Americans in general answer this question. The correct answer is strongly disagree, survey says. 16%. 16 16% of people strongly disagree that God accepts the worship of all religions. Now, here's the thing. Take that down. I don't want to look at that. Here's the thing. The law of non-contradiction which says that two opposite things can't be true at the same time, which is a basic law of reasoning, basic logical rule. You can have two things, both true at the same time, at the same place, and whatever. Something can't be A and not A. Okay, I can't say this exists and doesn't exist. Some stoners can be like, but dude. (laughs) But just think about it, man. Grow up, okay? Go play video games, whatever you're going to do. Listen, the law of non-contradiction is a basic law. The law of non-contradiction by itself makes this statement impossible because some people say God is this and others say he's the opposite of that, right? Different names, different attributes, different everything. They say, no, God is not this. For instance, they say Jesus is not God and we say Jesus is God. Jesus cannot both be and not be God. Stoners aside, dude, but to you, man, like in your heart, no, no. It's true or it's false. This, by just basic logic, has to be strongly disagreed. Has to be. Doesn't matter how pluralistic you want to be. Has to be. By its terms. Must be. So we don't even know basic logic. 16%. Wow. That's rough. 45% actually strongly agree with the statement. So not just agree. Not like I don't know. Not like maybe it's not. Strongly agree. 45%. Well, perhaps evangelicals who believe so many correct things about the Bible and Jesus' salvation will get it right. Survey says 32%. 32%. Now that means, if I'm doing math right, 68%, 68 of people who believe the Bible is true and that Jesus is the only way, they say they strongly agree Jesus is the only way to salvation, are saying that God worships, God accepts the worship of Satanists or whoever, right? Anybody, all religions he accepts. Come on. Come on. We got to get some courage. I don't think they believe that, but they weren't willing to say it. Here's the the part that's really bad. 46% of evangelicals strongly agreed. Worse than than Americans in general. They were 45. Evangelicals were 46. Less than a third of evangelicals answered this correctly. Less than a third. 46% strongly agreed. That was just like, they couldn't have understood the question. Again, that's an educational problem. We need to focus. We need to focus, Christ followers. We've got to focus. Focus on the word of God. We cannot evangelize and preach the good news if we cannot stand up for basic truths about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. It's exclusive. There is one way. 
If you don't understand that or you're not willing to say it, you don't understand the scriptures. There is one way. If you want to hear more about the exclusivity of Christ and the philosophical way that we defend that, you can go watch on our website or on the app. We've got like three different skeptic series with multiple. There's, there's several uh, parts in there where I talk about the exclusivity of Christ. All right, last, um, evangelicals who attend church once a week. Now, these guys should be good. They attend church once a week. They, they can't believe that God accepts the worship of everybody. Service says 38%. Less than 40% of people these are people who say the Bible is the highest authority for what they believe. The Bible is the highest authority for what they believe. And they attend church once a week. Less than 40% of them answered it correctly. <sighs> I watched a conversation this week between someone who was arguing for kind of progressive Christianity, which we've also talked about here. You can go back and, and look at that. And then there was someone who was arguing for kind of biblical, historical Christianity. They're having this conversation. And the man arguing for progressive Christianity uh, tried to make a point that what we do is more important than what we believe. And that sounds pretty good because he brings up this point of this Muslim man who did this heroic thing and this Christian man who did this rotten thing. And it was like, yeah, that's true. The, the guy who did the better thing, that seems like he'd be closer, right? Closer to the truth because he did the better thing. I thank God that the Muslim acted heroically. I'm sad and dismayed that the Christian man acted sinfully. But the idea that what you do is more important than what you believe is simply wrong and incredibly unbiblical. You are not saved by your works. You are not saved by your works. You can never act heroically enough to deserve to be saved. You don't deserve to be saved. The scripture is clear about that. The good unbeliever, that, that story is a lie. The good unbeliever is neither good nor saved because none of us are good, not one, for all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. And the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because of grace. Because of grace. This is, how, this is how it happens. This is how you start going down these roads where you start getting real fuzzy as they go, but what about the person who does good versus the person who believes everything right and does bad? Yeah, it's a person who believes everything right that gets saved because he didn't get saved because he did good. He got saved by the grace of God. And the person who did the good things is still a rebel against Christ. But we get swayed. It sounds good. And we go walking down like, yeah, that, does, that's, that, that does sound good. No, no, it doesn't. Understand how salvation works. It is wretched sinners who are saved, which is everyone. Everyone is a wretched sinner. Those who will submit to God will be saved. The, one, the people who say, I do good things, and they're right. They give money to charity. They do whatever. Maybe they do good, some good things. And they say, therefore, God ha- it would be unfair for him not to save me. No, it's unfair for him to save you. He had to die for you and rise again for you. This is how people get down these roads. The unbeliever who does good things is in rebellion to God because he rejects the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Romans 10, 9 through 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We build knowledge of the scriptures so that we build ourselves up to do what's right. That's why we do it. We do what is good because we love God, because we've been saved. We build the knowledge so we can do that. We don't do it. The action isn't what leads to salvation. The salvation is what leads to action. That you got to do God's will in order to do God's will. You got to know God's will in order to know God's will. You got to know the scriptures. Acts of goodness are not more important than what you believe. Of course, I want you to do acts of goodness. You were made for good works that He set out for you beforehand that you might walk in them. That's for sure. But what should be driving your actions is the fact that you love God because He first loved us. 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That while you were a rotten, wicked sinner, Christ was willing to go to the cross for you. He's God, and he's willing to come and be with us and go to the cross for you. Christians, do not believe progressive Christianity, my truth, worldliness, all that foolishness. There is one God. 
And his only begotten son is Jesus Christ. He died and rose again. And if you accept him, he'll give you his Holy Spirit. That's the truth. And he is a jealous and loving God, powerfully loving. You got to stand for truth. You got to know the fundamentals. The fundamentals of the faith, guys, beginning with what truth is. What truth is. And as we keep going, we're going to know how to defend that and how to defend the scriptures. If you are not a Christ follower, online, here in person, today's the day. Today is the day to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Because if you're not a Christ follower, you are under wrath. I don't want to offend you, but I sort of do. You're going to hell if you're not a Christ follower. It's just the facts. A good and holy God cannot accept you in your rebellion. You have to surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can do that today. You can do that today and you can begin to be alive in Christ and to know him and to know truth and freedom and love and joy and peace and faith and hope and more love. It's an amazing thing. Let's pray.